Howdy, and welcome back to the Maids of Reason podcast. My name is CJ, and today we'll be talking a bit of philosophy of religion. Uh, we'll also see how it applies to the Pope. Yeah, we're going there. Um, I think the best way to start this discussion off is with a bit of a personal anecdote. So my dad, if you don't know him, he was a very colorful character growing up. Uh, he was always known for his witty remarks. And as a, as a kid, I was quite argumentative. I loved to debate. I had the persistence of a woodpecker. Uh, you can see where this is going. So one day I was arguing with my dad, exacerbating him with a particularly lengthy sparring session. And my dad finally exclaimed, CJ, you could bring the Pope to his knees. Uh, he was, of course, meaning that even the Pope, with all of his holiness, his temperance and patience, wouldn't be able to stand me for very long if we were trapped in a room. Uh, I actually took that as a white flag and thought that I had bested my dad, <laughs> which that tells you a little bit about how argumentative I was. So he probably was right when he said that. Um, but where did he get this idea about the Pope, about how holy he was? You know, I was raised a Protestant. That's how my parents raised me. We never held that the Pope was some paragon of moral virtue. Yet, my dad's sentiments towards the Pope are pretty much ubiquitous. Um, much like Mother Teresa, Gandhi, there seems to be this universal preconceived notion that the Pope is on another level from the rest of humanity. Almost like he's another species or like a superhuman in his character or in the office that he holds. And I think this boils down to a fundamental misunderstanding of our telos. I told you we'd be getting into philosophy of religion. Telos is a Greek word that the philosophers of old, most notably Aristotle, were quite fond of. Um, and it's still used in modern philosophy and theology. When we ask what the telos of a thing is, we are asking what its purpose is. What is its final cause? Okay, so I'm actually going to write this on the board just so you guys can track with me. And we've got all of our terms here. Okay, so bear with me for a second. All right, there we go. We got the talos up there. <clears throat> I'm getting used to this whiteboard thing. All right. Okay, so everything you know, supernatural, natural, man-made, it doesn't matter. They all have their own telos. An acorn has the telos of growing into an oak tree. The telos of a pencil is to write. That's what they're designed for. Um, so this ties quite nicely into the philosophy of religion department. Um, we might ask, what is the telos of a human? It's, it's a fun question to ask people, actually. If you're ever at a party, just ask someone what they think the purpose of a human is. It'll tell you a lot about their worldview. A Buddhist would respond that their end, their purpose, their telos, is a form of non-existence. Uh, when their Atman is dissolved back into the Brahman, that's a form of non-existence and that's their telos. Uh, a naturalistic evolutionist, on the other hand, would likely say that your telos is to survive and propagate your DNA. Your average atheist might claim that we have no telos at all, no grand purpose, and that all sense of purpose beyond personal goals is illusory. This, I think, is actually quite intellectually honest on the part of the atheist. After all, how can you have a purpose without a designer? The pencil has the telos of writing specifically because someone came and tailored it for that purpose. So, the Abrahamic religions are different from all the rest. They would say that humanity's telos was given to us by God himself at the very creation of the universe. In Christianity, that telos is generally described as giving glory to God, and some also throw in sharing the love of God with others. You know, the golden rule, evangelism, that sort of thing. Okay? But that telos is rather vague and generalized like a one-size-fits-all answer. You might think of it as our telos from 30,000 feet up, um, but we need something a bit more granular if we are to know 
how to walk day by day. So I'm going to write up there on the board the general telos according to Christianity. Glorify God and love fellow man. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. All right. So we said that that's kind of the 30,000 foot up view. We need something more granular. That's where the scriptures come in. The, the Ten Commandments, for example, are a great outline for how a human glorifies God and loves his neighbor. And they're very concrete. But even that isn't specific enough for many of us. We, we need something higher resolution. We want to know what college God wants us to go to and who he wants us to marry, stuff like that. So it's at this nuanced level that I'd like to camp out for, at least for a little while. The first disclaimer I'll add, though, is that um, it would be a mistake to think that God has only one fixed will for you, and any deviation from that is a sin. Like, he predestined you to eat Cheerios instead of mini wheats tomorrow. And if you choose the wrong cereal, you might be grieving the spirit. Okay, like, it's a silly example, but this is how some people think. Um, that's not how the scriptures talk about things. There are plenty of good, God-honoring directions that your life can take. And it's one of the joys and privileges, honestly, of Christian liberty that we have a hand in choosing which one to follow. So with that said, there are boundaries. Some are hard boundaries, some are soft, and then some are somewhere in between. Okay, I would describe a hard boundary as anything you can be certain from specific revelation that God does not want you doing. So if you're trying to discern what career path to take, the Bible would prohibit you from being an abortionist or a drug dealer. If you're a woman, you can pretty much rest assured that God does not want you to be a pastor. Like, hard stop. A soft boundary, on the other hand, taking this example of a career path, would be things like time and location. So if you're an 18-year-old living in Japan, you might want to consider another job other than, like, the governor of Arizona. Um, it's probably not in the guards for you. There's nothing wrong with becoming the governor of Arizona. It's, you can do that, <laughs> but it just doesn't make the most logistical sense. That's all. So that's a factor when we consider God's will. In between those two things, I think there's the more subtle promptings from God. Um, in this category, I would include your skills, your passions, your conscience, and your current responsibilities. If God blessed you with the body of an Oompa Loompa, and a burning love of math, the NBA probably isn't for you. And if you're a mom of four with the conscience of a pacifist, God probably doesn't want you to join the military. It's not impossible that that's your calling. Crazier things have been done in, in God's church. But these are all factors which God gives us to guide us along our journeys. Okay, with all of that out of the way, we now need to talk about the popes. Um, more specifically, the Pope's gone wild. Uh, in an act of Christian charity, I won't single out the worst Pope in history, for my example. Instead, I'll pick on the current Roman pontiff. Uh, that would be Pope Francis. And uh, I'm not saying that he's perfect or that he's the devil, but we do need to take a look at him because of what he's been doing. I know he's low-hanging fruit, and I know he's not representative of all popes. You know, there have been good popes. I, I'm the first to admit that. I do have a respect for parts of the Catholic Church. Uh, John, pope John Paul II, for example, much of his writings, specifically his theology of the body, I love. Really respect him for that. But Pope Francis is the current pope, and we have to address the big, pink, glittery, serpentine elephant in the room. Um, his Holiness has endorsed same-sex civil unions. He's called the death penalty, quote, an attack on the inviolability and dignity of the person. 
And most recently, he signed a document with Imam al-Azhar that stated that God wills all religions in the same way he wills diversity of gender, culture, and language. That's religious pluralism. There is no gentle way to say it. This is antichrist behavior, okay? We are led to believe by the Catholic Church that the Pope is the holy vicar of Christ and that he enjoys by divine institution nothing less than the supreme, full, immediate, and universal power in the care of souls. That's straight out of the council, which is infallible. His telos, it would seem, is to feed and shepherd the entire church, perhaps even the entire world, in the absence of Christ incarnate. That is quite a purpose to be given. But what does that make him? Is it holier than you? Is it closer to perfection than you and I? To answer that, we need to go back to the acorn and the pencil. Perfection has at least two distinct meanings in philosophy of religion. The first is what I'll call perfection proper. So I'm going to write this on the board too. First is The first is perfection proper, which is um, like a divine uh, perfection. This includes all the omnis. Uh, think of Anselm, that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Here we're talking about morally flawless, um, omnibenevolent, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, all, all of the omnis, okay? The other sense of perfection is complete or unperverted telos. Excuse the poor marker. Unperverted talos. So the perfect acorn is not an all-powerful acorn. It's an acorn that does acorn things in the most acorn way. Okay? It sprouts at just the right time. It grows at just the right rate. It has just the right ratio of leaves to branches. You know, the list goes on. The perfect pencil is the one that writes the smoothest, erases the best, fits the hand the most ergonomically, you get the point. This is, I think, a much better standard of holiness than what we see with the Pope. By the way, holiness in Hebrew is kadosh. I'll write that too. Kadosh. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Holy, 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 right? Kadosh simply means set apart or dedicated for a divine purpose. I would argue that one is holy, kadosh, to the degree that they conform themselves to the telos bestowed on them by God. So let's take Luther's famous example of the faithful commoner. I'm going to go through two different passages, actually. Um, the first one is from his lectures on Genesis 26 through 50. I'm just going to read it. What you do in your house is worth as much as if you did it up in heaven for our Lord God. For what we do in our calling here on earth, in accordance with his word and command, he counts as if it were done in heaven for him. Therefore, we should accustom ourselves to think of our position and work as sacred and well-pleasing to God, not on account of the position and the work, but on account of the word and faith from which the obedience and the work flow. No Christian should despise his position and in life if he is living in accordance with the word of God, but should say, I believe in Jesus Christ and do as the Ten Commandments teach and pray that our dear Lord God may help me thus to do. That is a right and holy life and cannot be made holier even if one fast himself to death. <laughs> That's a bone statement. It goes on. It looks like a great thing when a monk renounces everything and goes into a cloister, carries on a life of asceticism, fasts, watches, prayers, etc. On the other hand, it looks like a small thing when a maid cooks and cleans and does other housework. 
But because God, but, but because God's command is there, even such a small work must be praised as a service to God, far surpassing the holiness and asceticism of all monks and nuns. For here there is no command of God, but there is God's command. But there God's command is fulfilled, that one should honor their father and mother and help in the care of the home. So what he's saying there is essentially that you've got these monks doing works that men contrived. You know, God doesn't get any uh, joy or pleasure out of certain things the monks were doing that were just self-righteous, um, just part of tradition and not part of his word. And then you've got the housemaid, the house servant, who's doing things that are directly found in the Bible. And so, you know, a million man-made good things are not worth even one uh, God-prescribed good thing. Okay, I'm going to quote another passage. This is from his text, uh, the, Bab- the Babylonian captivity of the church. Okay, Therefore, I advise no one to enter any religious order or the priesthood. Indeed, I advise everyone against it. He was stirring up trouble. Unless he is forearmed with this knowledge and understands that the works of monks and priests, however holy and arduous they may be, do not differ one whit in the sight of God from the works of the rustic laborer in the field or the woman going about her household tasks, but that all works are measured before God by faith alone. Indeed, the menial housework of a maidservant uh, or a maid or maidservant is often more acceptable to God than all the fastings and other works of a monk or priest, because the monk or priest lacks faith. Since therefore vows nowadays, he's talking about uh, the, the monk's vows when they enter the, the monastery, vows nowadays seem to tend only to the glorification of works and to pride. It is to be feared that there is nowhere less of a faith and of the church than among the priests, monks, and bishops. These men are, in truth, heathens or hypocrites. They imagine themselves to be the church or the heart of the church, the spiritual estate, and the leaders of the church when they are everything else but that. This is indeed the people of the captivity— among whom all things freely given to us in baptism are held captive, while the few poor people of the earth who are left behind, such as the married folk, appear vile in their eyes. See, this is what I love about Luther, (laughs) because Luther is just so relevant, always, like timelessly so. Um, And it's because he speaks from the Bible, and the Bible is consistently relevant throughout all of time. It speaks to us in all ages. Uh, specifically here, I think he's looking at Colossians three seventeen, on which he builds this, this doctrine of his. And that is, uh, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. So, imagine for a moment a faithful little boy sweeping the living room floor while singing a hymn. Okay, it's a beautiful picture. That boy is fulfilling his talos on every level of analysis. I'll go through each of them. From a 30,000-foot view of God's purpose for him, like we talked about, he's doing exactly what he should. He's bringing glory to God through the hymn and showing love to his, uh, to his fellow uh, men, his fellow uh, brethren, uh, through service to the family unit. Um, zooming in a bit further, He's doing God's will by obeying the scriptures. He's, he's obeying the Ten Commandments specifically, honor thy father and mother. So he's already hit both. He's hit the major talos, glorify God, love your fellow man. And then second to that, we've got the scriptures, every jot and tittle. Finally, at the highest resolution, he's fulfilling his calling by choosing an action which his skills, desires, conscience, and circumstances, you know, his place and time, which they all direct him towards doing in this moment. This boy is truly kadosh, holy, okay? Pope Francis, on the other hand, is so close yet so far away from kadosh. In fact, he's just one letter away, uh, and it makes a world of difference. He is kadesh. Let me write this.
Kadosh Kadesh, okay? This Hebrew word can also mean set apart, but not for religious things. It's set apart for prostitution, if I'm being blunt. This word is used to describe male whores, specifically male temple prostitutes, sometimes heterosexual, sometimes not so much, okay? So I'm going to write that on the board. All right, so Deuteronomy 23, 17 through 18. Let me pull it up here. It, it talks exactly about this. Quote, None of the daughters of Israel shall be a cult prostitute, and none of the sons of Israel shall be a cult prostitute. You shall not bring the fee of a prostitute or the wages of a dog into the house of the Lord your God in payment for any vow, for both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. Wow. So Israel is repeatedly called out uh, for playing the whore in the Old Testament when she abandons her covenant with Adonai and makes friendly with the pagan nations and their gods. It's false gods, demons. Okay. In the same way, Pope Francis is playing the part of a temple prostitute sitting on high, claiming to be one of God's chosen people yet in bed with all the false gods of the world. Remember that quote. The excuse I hear time and time again is that nobody's perfect. Everyone sins, everyone except Mary, that is. There's always going to be one guy who gives the whole tradition a bad name, yada, yada. I've heard this. Well, if that really was the case, that it was just one bad apple, then why doesn't the rest of the church do anything about it? The cardinals, bishops, priests, deacons, they should all be climbing over each other to depose him. At the first whiff of this Antichrist behavior, they should have formed a council and marched right up to the Vatican doors with pitchforks and torches in hand. It's kind of ironic, actually. I would venture to guess that 90% of all past popes would have burned Francis at the stake as a heretic for saying the things that he's saying and doing the things that he's done. No, instead, I, I fear that this is much more. I, I fear, I more or less know, that the Catholic Church is corrupt from the top down. Every Catholic who doesn't call for the Pope to be dethroned has the blood of remote cooperation with evil on their hands. God helped them, God helped them when, after millions of years in purgatory, <laughs> they reach the pearly gates and have to account for it. Anyway, uh, long story short, I know that was a rant. Be a faithful acorn, okay? Follow God faithfully according to his word, according to your idiosyncratic gifts, and according to your circumstances, the responsibilities that you've already been given in life. From there, trust God with the rest. And if you get discouraged with the results, just remember that the Lord regards you as holier than the Pope. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Peace to you in Christ.